Um, I'm excited about this event, uh, and, and I hope all of you are too. I'm excited because the, this document, which was uh, given to us by Pope Francis uh, two years ago, uh, two years ago this month, and went into effect two years ago, June 1st, uh, is, I believe, a significant step forward for the, for the church in dealing with the uh, crisis of clerical sexual abuse, and particularly with the question of establishing count of accountability for bishops. Um, our guests, which I will introduce in alphabetical order, um, are all canonists, though not all only canonists, um, who have expertise not only in this document, but in the application of it, and can will be able to tell us um, about how it works. We decided to do this event, not just because I think Vos Estes is important, but because I think a lot of Catholics in the United States in particular know very much about Vos Estes. In the summer of 2018 and into the spring of 2019, there was a lot of concern, obviously, about the abuse crisis in the Catholic Church and a lot of questions about what is the church doing about this and what is Rome going to do about this and specifically about what is Rome going to do to make sure that bishops are held accountable as well as priests and others. Um, Vos Estes is, in a significant way, the, the church's response to that question. It's not a final response to that question. Um, we can talk about this in the panel, but the document was promulgated with a three-year term period. It is ad experimentum, which means that we have a three-year trial period. We're two years into that trial period now, after which the document will expire. This is the church's sort of first crack at solving this tough nut. And uh, that means that while it is a step forward, it's also imperfect. And it's we know that. Uh, we've had two years to see how this uh, document, this change in law, uh, has played out. There have been some good things, some not so good things. There are some things that we can hope will be addressed going forward. We, we like to look at all of that. When Vos Estes was first promulgated, there were a lot of expectations from Catholics for what this document might accomplish. Some of those expectations were wildly high. Some of them were very, very low. I think the reality is somewhere in the middle. Um, and my hope is that we can better understand the document after the end of this panel uh, and have some sense of what, where it has succeeded and where it might lay the foundation for future reforms uh, for the church. So with that little introduction for where we're gonna go today, let me introduce our panelists. As I said, um, I'll do this in order of, in alphabetical order. Uh, Father John Beale is a professor of canon law here at the Catholic University of America, where he's been teaching full time since I believe 1992. Susan Mulheron is the Chancellor for Canonical Affairs at the Archdiocese of St. Paul, Minneapolis, and received her license in canon law here from the Catholic University of America. Uh, Monsignor Bob Oliver is a priest of the Archdiocese of Boston. He was, until very recently, Secretary of the Vatican's Pontifical Commission for the Protection of Minors. Before that, he worked at the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith. Uh, bishop Thomas Paprocki is the Bishop of Springfield in Illinois. He holds many degrees, among them a degree in civil law from DePaul, as well as a doctorate in canon law from the Gregorian in Rome. Welcome to all of you. Thank you. Good to be with you. Um, I think the first place we'll start um, is with a brief overview of what Vos Estes is. So I'm going to ask each of you to, to speak a little bit about some aspect of Vos Estes just to try and fill in a rough sketch of what the document is, and then we can move into more substantive questions and dig down a little bit into uh, how, the, how the law works in practice and, and how it might change going forward. I'll begin with you, Susan. Just very simply, what does Vos Estes aim to accomplish? Thanks, Stephen. Oh, what does it aim to accomplish? So um, what we know about Vos Estes is that this was legislation issued by Pope Francis just a few months after the global summit meeting in Rome on sexual abuse of minors. If you remember, he, he summoned all the heads of Episcopal conferences and other you know, significant religious leaders to Rome to talk about this. And what we heard at that conference, which took place after a number of significant events in the church involving, that raised a lot of questions about or highlighted the gaps, I guess, in bishop accountability. Um, what we felt most poignantly here in the United States was uh, the reports about 
former Cardinal McCarrick. Um, we had this, this conference in Rome and just a few months later, Vos Estes comes out and it does a number of things in terms of legislation. It's a document that I would call sweeping as a canonist. It, um, it, it, it does so much. It can be a little bit difficult to wrangle and, and to work out with the specificity that we're, that we're used to as canonists, but what does it try to aim to accomplish? You can get a good idea about that by reading the introduction to the document. If you pull it up and just read those first couple of paragraphs, and even just by looking at the title alone, Bos Estes Lux Mundi, which in Latin means you are the light of the world. And that title quotes from the gospel of Matthew, you know, a city set on a hill uh, cannot be hidden. It's about bringing light to these things that previously in our past in the church um, characteristically were often hidden, kept secret or silent or deliberately ignored. It's sending a signal that that is not acceptable. That's not how we're going to function. And these are some of the concrete ways in which we are going to change that culture and that way of operating. So it does a number of things in it. Uh, it institutes a mandatory reporting requirement. This is a new requirement in the church, uh, mandatory reporting for, for clergy and members of religious orders to report certain harmful acts that are committed by other clergy and members of religious orders. It defines specifically what those acts are in a particular way with um, a level of detail that we've not seen before from the church, especially in, in legislation. It states specifically as well that a bishop who either commits one of these acts of harm, sexual abuse, um, or who does something to avoid or to interfere with investigations of these acts, that bishop is to be investigated for that harmful conduct in and of itself. These are all um, new things in, the, in, in terms of how they are set forth in that specific language. If you look at the law of the church in the previous history, it's not like all of a sudden now we think those things are wrong. It means that um, we've realized that we need to be more direct, more specific in setting forth, this is the expectation, this is what you are to do when this happens. Give those more direct instructions. So it, it fills a number of significant gaps, um, you know, kind of fills the silence, if, if you would, um, that we had seen that would hinder what we need for accountability for bishops in particular. In a particular way, um, it, it responds to a need that we also saw in 2016, Pope Francis issued another motu proprio, another law called um, As a Loving Mother. And in that document, um, he, he set forth the, the situations, the specific circumstances under which a bishop could be removed from office. And one of those being uh, negligence or, or failure to handle property, properly claims of sexual abuse of minors. Again, that doesn't mean that before the motu proprio, a bishop couldn't have been removed for that, but um, it says very clearly that this is the expectation again. The challenge with as a loving mother, it just it started with this presumption that these complaints about bishops were already on the desk of the officials in Rome. They were there. So, OK, the, we have this complaint and then this is what we'll do about it. But it didn't give the process for getting those complaints there. So that's what we see in um, the rest of Vos Estes. You get through Article one, which says this is what the offenses are. The rest of it is this is the process if you've had this um, if you have a report to make about a bishop about this type of conduct, this is the process by which you can do it. These are the people um, who are involved. So it fills that gap. So it's like a gap filler of a document. If you had to make me summarize it in a much shorter explanation than what I just gave. Oh, that's very helpful. Very helpful. Um, Father Beal, uh, as Susan pointed out, this this Vos Estes didn't sort of fall out of the blue. Um, it fits into existing law, builds on uh, existing law, but also on on some of the the ways that the church has handled allegations against bishops or or as uh, apostolic visitations in the past. Tell us a little bit about how 
what is what is new and what is not new about both studies? How does it fit into the existing law and where did this document come from? Uh, I was not involved in the drafting of it and I have no particular insights into the genesis of the document. Uh, I think it's fair to say that it was in process in some stage well before the horrible summer of 2018. Uh, there were several principles that are theological, canonical, that the drafters had to deal with. First is that it has been a settled principle in canon law since the Gregorian reform of the 11th century that only the Roman pontiff, the Pope, can discipline a bishop. Uh, second, uh, since that time, uh, one of the instruments by which the Roman pontiff has exercised his oversight has been the institute of what is sometimes referred to as an apostolic visitation. Uh, those have been going on in a variety of forms. And third, uh, in both the codes of the canon law, 1917 and 1983, it is foreseen that the metropolitan, the chief bishop of an ecclesiastical province might conduct such an investigation at the behest of the Roman pontiff. Uh, so those are principles they had to work with. Um, as the sexual abuse crisis unfolded, there were a variety of trial and error efforts to deal with cases as they arose. Uh, in St. Paul in Minneapolis, there was the case of Archbishop Neustadt. Uh, in Los Angeles, Archbishop Gomez had the awkward situation of dealing with his predecessor who was at least accused of being negligent in handling cases as they arose. So there was sort of a trial and error going on that seemed to slowly evolve toward the present method that came out in those estes. If you want to see the trial run, uh, look at the history of the investigation of Bishop Bransfield in Wheeling, Charleston, West Virginia, by the archbishop of that province, um, Bishop Laurie. Uh, it looks like those estes before its time. But these are the you know, three principles, and this is how it has e emerged somewhat with trial and error, trying to fill the gap for providing an adequate method for dealing with bishops who themselves are uh, uh, committed uh, offenses or who were negligent. One of the... Uh questions that needs to be asked, and this will be for, for you, Monsignor Oliver, is uh, b moving beyond questions of precedent or procedure. Um, how does this law um, affect uh, survivors? So what can survivors expect the church to be, how can the survivors expect the church to be responsive in ways they weren't before? Your work um, on the Pontif Pontifical Commission put you in a position to see, uh, to have sort of a bird's eye view over much of the church uh, to how uh, uh, survivors' cases were handled in different ways throughout the church. What has this law changed in how those, those not only how those cases have been handled, but how survivors encounter a church that has um, been the source of great harm in their lives? Thank you. Thank you, Stephen. You used a, a good image before, I think, of this being a, a great step forward. Uh, I, I tend to think we will look back and say that this was a, de a decisive step. You, know, you can only say that in retrospect, of course, but there have been some documents, some efforts, as Father Beal was just saying, that really have proven to be lasting. One of the most important, of course, being Sacramentorum Sanctitatis Tutela, which deals with these cases in terms of the abuse of a minor by a cleric by the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith. So Bosestis is building on that. In fact, it refers to it. It doesn't take the cases away from the CDF. It says, in addition to those, we wish to look at these. And what it does is, particularly in the context, as you say, of uh, how victim survivors and their families 
and really the, the Catholic community uh, receives what it is that we're doing. Uh, the image I like to try to use, uh, connecting to what both Susan and Father Bio were saying, is that Bosestis is within a context. Of course, we've been, uh, the church has been responding for some time. There are structures in place which Bosestis is trying to revitalize. And the image that I try to use is that Pope Francis is attempting to breathe life into these structures. We've defied negligence in, in the codes of canon law, the Western and the Eastern churches. Uh, it's a crime, but we weren't prosecuting these crimes. We describe the rights of people in canonical processes, but there are many questions about them. And in many instances, people were feeling that they weren't being enforced in the proper way. So, you know, I would say that if we look at this document in, it, in itself, and then what I'd like to say when we talk about victims uh, is that if we also look at another document that came right after that conference in February of 2019, which Susan mentioned, I'll give a little plug for our commission. Our commission was the one that uh, suggested uh, we're an advisory commission to the Holy Father. We proposed that that uh, conference be held. The Holy Father brought together all of those folks. Father Beale's right. I'm sure that these uh, documents were in process because just a few weeks after the conference, the first major document that came out was the new law for the Vatican City State. The Holy Father can legislate a civil document for the Vatican City State because he's the head of a civil government. And he can say things there, which is a little harder to say in ecclesiastical document. And if you look at that law together with Vos Estes, I think you'll see what he's really trying to get at. He begins by saying, we really need to see these efforts in the theological canonical context, as has been said. He says the protection of minors and vulnerable persons, looking at them together, is an integral part of the gospel message. We are called to proclaim this message to the whole world. And therefore, he said, a, he said a, I think, an important statement. He says, I want to strengthen even more the institutions and the regulations that we currently have, both to prevent and to counter the abuses against minors and vulnerable persons. And therefore, he said, what I hope is we'll create a community that is respectful and mindful of the rights of minors and of vulnerable persons, and that this community will be more vigilant so that as we see and as we come to know of and even to suspect that people are suffering violence and abuse and abandonment and all sorts of offenses, that we will take action. This is the mandatory reporting requirement that Susan mentioned. This is new. Uh, it's within the uh, civil law now of the Vatican City State. It's within church law with Vos Estes. Vos Estes, that's in paragraph three of Vos Estes. In paragraph four for victims uh, and for those making reports, it says that they will not be subject to any prejudice, any retaliation, any discrimination for making a report. If you suspect something's happening, a founded suspicion, it is our duty now under law to report those suspicions. It's now a duty for those uh, who lead the church in any ecclesiastical office, women, men, bishops, uh, to do, to act. Uh, by the way, one of the things you're going to ask later is what do we need to continue to move forward on? We're going to need structures in place if that doesn't happen. What happens if you bring something to, I don't know, the Chancellor of St. Uh, Paul, Minneapolis, for example, and she, uh, you know, uh, is going to be questioned. Every one of us is going to be questioned for how we handle these things. And then in that same paragraph, it talks about there's no obligation of silence. We cannot oblige someone not to talk about these things. That was then expanded by Pope Francis. I'll give one more document from 2019. Uh, I'm sure there'll be many more, but at the end of the year, in December, the Holy Father issued two rescripts. Uh, there's an instruction from the Secretary of State, there's a rescript making some changes, and one of these is saying that the pontifical secret does not apply to these accusations, and that people cannot be obliged to silence. So lastly, I don't want to go too long, you can talk forever and ever about this. But Vos Estes, I think, should be seen in this broader context. Those are the paragraphs I just mentioned to you. But in the broader context, what we're saying is that victims will be welcomed. 
they'll be listened to, they'll be accompanied when they come forward, that they'll be given the rights that belong to them as human persons in these cases, that will provide pastoral care for them, spiritual, medical, psychological, will give them legal support. They have a right that these accusations be adjudicated through a proper process and that they be properly part of those processes, whether they be penal or whether they be disciplinary. And again, uh, here we're talking about rights that they have, legal rights. And this is a process that will continue. Uh, lastly, to say that in that document, uh, the Holy Father in the um, law for the Vatican City State, Holy Father talks about the right to, to information in a way that is new. It's not in Bos Estes yet, but during, during a process, during an investigation, during a penal process, at the end of the penal process, the victims, I would say, is <laughs> and this will keep me going. Um, the victims are most concerned about this aspect. How is it that they are uh, the communications that we? Um... So, last plug for the commission: we're going to be undertaking a study of that. We're going to bring together a seminar of folks uh, at the end of this year to be studying questions like that. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That's that's wonderful, uh, Bishop Paprocki. Uh, we'll turn to you. Um, this is a, a, an issue in a document that you approach sort of wearing several different hats. One as a, a canonist, obviously, but also as uh, a pastor and a bishop. Um, this question, you could take whatever tack you like on it, but I, I think I'm most interested in, in it from a, at least this question and how you view this as a, as a pastoral matter, um, especially given sort of the tensions in the church in the United States over the last couple of years and this emphasis on, on uh, Episcopal credibility and Episcopal account accountability, um, does a law like Vos Estes come as a relief to you as a pastor? Uh, yes, I would say it definitely does. It comes as a relief to me, not only as a pastor, but also uh, as a canonist and as a civil lawyer. It's it just very helpful to have some clarity on uh, the process, you know, for a person who feels aggrieved, uh, the question, well, what do I do? Where do I go? Uh, what steps do I take? And I think Vos Estes uh, gives us at least a start on that. I think there's some areas that still need to be developed a little bit, but I think it's a major step moving us in the right direction. So uh, I have uh, been involved in uh, handling uh, cases of uh, clerical sexual misconduct with minors for almost 30 years. It was in 1992 that I was appointed chancellor of the Archdiocese of Chicago uh, by Cardinal Joseph Bernadine. And uh, the very first assignment I was given was to work with our uh, uh, civil lawyer and our uh, uh, in-house uh, uh, diocesan council and our director of personnel to develop policies and procedures for clerical sexual misconduct with minors, uh, out of which came our uh, review board and uh, policies that uh, were very much a model for many other dioceses around the, the country in some ways, I think laid the foundation also for the, uh, the, the charter and the essential norms 10 years later in 2002. And so uh, I just remember at the time you had uh, a lot of people uh, raising their concerns about uh, allegations of priests abusing minors. And it was similar then, people didn't know, well, where do I go, what do I do? And so coming up with policies made it very clear. And I'd say there were two hallmarks of what we did. One was the victim assistance ministry, uh, which Monsignor Oliver was just talking about the care for victims is very important. And that was very well received and implemented, I think, uh, pretty much across the board. The other part was a little more controversial and it was the use of review boards. And uh, I had, I remember uh, priests saying, oh, the uh, priests are accountable to the bishop. And, and so to have these review boards with lay people involved, uh, that's, uh, that's, that's, um, that's a barrier to step in, in between my, me and my relationship with my bishop. And our answer to that was, well, review boards are advisory to the bishop. Yes, it's the bishop who is the decision maker, but uh, the bishop should be able to get uh, advice uh, and recommendations from competent people who know how to handle these kinds of cases. I think we're in a very a similar situation uh, with uh, allegations uh, against bishops. You have people saying well, uh, bishops are only accountable to the Supreme Pontiff and only the 
the Pope can discipline a bishop. And that's, that's very true. But once again, uh, the Pope is thousands of miles away and not able to do an investigation himself. And so I think the question uh, has been, well, how do we do that and where do we go? Uh, so again, in my own experience, uh, I was mentioned I was appointed chancellor in 1992. It was a year later that there was an allegation against Cardinal Bernadine himself. Stephen Cook um, made an allegation, a former seminarian of his. And uh, uh, so uh, we pretty much, not having Vosestis at the time, pretty much had to just go by whatever we could find in canon law on that and the rest to kind of make, make it up as we went along, which is kind of interesting how what we did back in 90, 1993 is very similar to what is, is contained in Vos Estes. So as the Cardinal's delegate uh, to the review board, I took that case to our review board in the Archdiocese of Chicago and they looked into the matter. And uh, then before they were uh, able to conclude their case, Stephen Cook actually recanted his allegation. And so we, uh, essentially closed the case with the recommendation that the case be closed. But then normally the review board would report to the archbishop, but in this case, the archbishop was the one accused. So the question to me as his delegate, well, what do I do with this? And uh, following canon law, I made the decision to bring it to the senior suffragan bishop. And the senior suffragan bishop then made his report uh, to the Holy See through the apostolic nuncio. So it's very interesting looking, looking back uh, what we did is, is pretty much what we would do under Vos Estes. But now we have, that, uh, we have that clear and we have that process spelled out. Uh, the other thing I would, would point out is uh, in terms of some areas that I think need to be fleshed out uh, a, a little bit would be uh, in Vos Estes in, um, in Article 5, it talks about the, the care of, um, of persons, uh, but it doesn't really... Uh, spell out, uh, you know, like a victim assistance ministry. And uh, similarly, in Article 13, it talks about uh, the use of um, uh, qualified persons, but doesn't spell out as clearly the way we, we normally define review boards and the members of review boards uh, in our dioceses. Fortunately, uh, we also have a, a companion document uh, in the United States, the USCCB, uh, adopted directives also for a three-year basis, the directives for the implementation of the provisions of those ex estes. And in the directives for implementation, there, there is further specificity uh, about uh, providing assistance to, uh, to victims and survivors of sexual abuse, and also further um, a specification about the kinds of persons that uh, should be involved uh, as the qualified persons to whom the metropolitan or the senior suffragan uh, can go. But those, uh, uh, the, the way I read it, are still somewhat uh, optional uh, at, the, at the metropolitan's discretion uh, and not as clear. I think most dioceses are very clear about who is appointed to the review board and uh, what are their expertise. And I, I think that we don't necessarily have that clarity with uh, who is the metropolitan going to consult. And there's pros and cons on that. I think what we came up with prior to Vos Estes, uh, when we were uh, talking about some of this with the USCCB Committee on Canonical Affairs, we were uh, talking about something like a national review board. We weren't gonna use that term because we already have a national review board. It doesn't handle cases, but talks more about policy, but some kind of a national commission. Uh, the advantage if we had one body like that, that would uh, deal with all cases in the US would be some consistency and uh, uniformity. Um, the, the downside is of course, you, you, know, you could have allegations from all over the country and where would that commission be? Where would they come from? So in that regard, the metropolitan model is I think a good approach. It makes it regional, it makes it local. But I, I think the downside of that is a possibility for uh, unevenness. I mean, so in, in a metropolitan and a large metropolitan archbishop in a large metropolitan area, may have lots of experts that he can call on in psychology, sociology, uh, and uh, uh, the law. Whereas a uh, smaller uh, province, the metropolitan may be hard pressed uh, to find that kind of expertise. And so the result is there may be some unevenness uh, around our country and how these things are, are uh, dealt with. So those are just some of my, my takes uh, as a bishop and as a uh, canon lawyer and civil lawyer on both Estes. Thank you. I, I want to go to Susan to talk about um, 
lay experts involved in uh, these sorts of uh, investigations. Um, but right before I do that, you know, one of the things that that leaps to mind is that you know we're we here are all sort of in the American context, but this is a universal law. Both this is universal law, so it applies to places that might be sort of decades behind the United States in terms of having the 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 systems in place and the procedures in place uh, uh, that we have here in the United States. Um, so, you know, I, I think, for example, of this question of Vosestis mentions allows for reliance on lay experts for investigations, but doesn't go so far as to mandate it. Um, for, for the Americans, we can sometimes sort of, how can you not mandate this? Because we're thinking about our own context. Um, um, so, Susan, you've you've been involved with with um, these sorts of investigations in the past. I know we're not going to get into any sort of specifics of any cases, um, but I think it would be interesting, certainly to me, and I hope to our, to our viewers, if you could give us a sort of a breakdown of of what, uh, on a practical level, what does the involvement of a lay candidate in a case like this look like? I know that depends a lot on where you are and what resources are in the archdiocese and who your who, who your archbishop is. But at a practical level, how did, in, in the cases you've been involved in, how were, how were you sort of um, positioned to, to, to work on these cases and, and, and other lay, lay men and women as well? Sure. Um, well, the, as, as Bishop Propaki helpfully explained, um, the, the value of engaging the lay persons in these processes, um, I think especially the bishops in the United States have done a really great job of highlighting that um, not just to their, their fellow bishops and other dioceses, but to the Holy See and to the world at what you can do when you break outside that kind of clerical wall and you, you tap those experts for these really complicated, difficult, and high stakes types of reports. Um, so you, when you look at, at Vos Estes, it, the good thing is, what I like about it is that it, it doesn't require that the bishop only use clergy, for example. Um, you know, we have a history in canon law, which is changing kind of bit by bit of um, requiring these uh, canonical processes to be um, done either exclusively by clerics or by a majority of clerics. So you can kind of have a lay person involved maybe as a concession uh, if you don't have enough clergy. Um, it's, it's clearly not saying that um, we want to invite the laity in because of the gifts and expertise that they have because they're lay. Um, what we see in Vos Estes is that it doesn't go that far in, in affirming it, but it doesn't close the door. So it, it leaves it open. Um, and, and then, like Bishop mentioned, the bishops of this United States have committed themselves to that lay involvement in a number of significant ways. Um, the document, um, the, the, it's called the Directives for the Implementation of the Motu Proprio. It's on the USCCB website. Um, if anyone has not read that, I recommend that you, that you read it. I think it's um, something that's, it's not nearly as well known as the, the Motu Proprio itself, but it's really helpful for understanding its implementation in the United States. So in that document, the bishops committed to the appointment of what they call a qualified lay person. Uh, for every, every uh, metropolitan and senior suffragan who, who might receive the reports instead of the metropolitan. And that person, it gives a number of duties for that person to carry out, um, just advising the bishop in every step of the way, and also significantly being um, a point of contact who can receive reports. So that's responsive to some of the feedback that has come that you know, someone who's been harmed by the church or is trying to accuse a bishop of something might not be comfortable approaching another bishop and making a report. So here's a lay person who has been designated who can receive those reports. Um, and then advising the bishop along the way. That's built into what the bishops have committed to do. They also committed to um, uh, implementing the uses of a lay investigator. So um, instead of, uh, you know, what, if those of us who read the McCarrick report were, uh, at least I was haunted by um, those accounts of these, you know, the report comes in and one bishop writes to another bishop, say, hey, what do you think? I don't know. It looks good to me. There was no investigation. There was no um, sending it to a lay investigator. There wasn't really an investigation. You can see it laid out clearly in those documents. 
what we see in this motu proprio and in the um, commitment of our U.S. bishops is that is not what will happen anymore. Um, and if it does happen, there's a process to make a report about that and investigate that and follow up and hold that bishop accountable for that. <clears throat> um, so in like in terms of a practical step, you know, how are the laity involved? Often the report itself comes from a lay person. It can be presented to a lay person. Um, the, the, again, with the U.S. bishops, that, that bishop will um, consult with at least one lay expert in making that initial assessment because he has to assess whether it's manifestly unfounded or what he should do with it, where it should go. And he connects with those lay experts at that along the way. Um, just in my own experience as a canonist working for a metropolitan archbishop, um, you know, my duties include um, making sure, are we implementing this motu proprio and the directives of the U.S. bishops? Are we doing that? You know, go through, have we done everything? How are we to do it? How are we publicizing this, making sure it's known? How do we educating uh, our faithful and other faithful about what this requires? Um, training, giving training to our qualified layperson, making sure they understand because the can canonical stuff in here, there's a lot of terminology that, you know, how do you just making sure that person has that appropriate background? Um, training the investigator. Uh, working with the investigator most of the time, um, helping him or her assess the proofs, helping the bishop assess the report. What is this? Is this something that even falls under vocestis? You can imagine that, uh, okay, now we have a report to make complaints against, against bishops. It might attract uh, complaints that are reports that don't fall under the things that are described in article one. So a bishop needs someone to look through that, give him your opinion. What, what should we do with this? R drafting up that report that goes to the nuncio, that goes to Rome. What is this? What, do, what is our assessment of it? Um, these are The bishop can and should involve lay experts all along the way along these steps. Um, also, the offering of the pastoral care to the one who's been harmed the U.S. bishops committed to having the qualified lay person be involved in that, which is again important. If um, sometimes that that person might want to hear from the bishop himself or 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 another priest, but sometimes that's the last thing that they would want. So you they recognize the importance of having that lay person available. It might be the right person to communicate with the person who's been harmed in making the report. Um, so it's just it it opens the door for that lay involvement throughout the entire process. And um, our bishops have been really great about that. Just based on my conversations with my counterparts in other dioceses, their experience has been the same. Um, so that's that's something that is that is going well. And it, it it's it's a step forward, I think. And it um, I think we can just expect to see more um, affirmations of that type of uh, value in, 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 in having those lay experts involved as we see further developments in the law. Thank you, Susan. Um, in addition to the question of lay involvement, one of the biggest uh, questions about vos estis um, and, and moving forward is a question about transparency. Um, Father Beale, uh, you gave a paper, I believe in December of 2019 in Rome, in which you argued that greater transparency is critical for effective governance. Um, explain what you mean by that. I, I didn't really say uh, effective governance. I was referring to the legitimacy or the sense legitimacy. And in any organization like the church, which uh, is based on a very strong belief or faith system. When the leadership are perceived to be operating for self-centered motives, uh, the whole structure of plausibility of the institution is shaken and it may lead to the total collapse of people's uh, faith. And we've seen that with the um, system, uh, uh, the sexual abuse crisis, that people have left the church, uh, have lost faith in the church because it is perceived 
that church leadership is more interested in preserving the image of the church and salvaging vocations than caring for the vulnerable. Uh, the way to overcome that is for governance or leadership of the church to be open and transparent uh, in its operation. Accountable, not just upward on the hierarchical scale to the Pope and the congregations of the Roman Curia, but accountable as well to uh, the faithful uh, and to uh, the rest of the community of faith. Uh, and the best way to do that is to be open and clear about what is going on. How do how does the church? This isn't just for the church, but how do you how do we balance uh, appropriate confidentiality? That the kind of confidentiality that's appropriate to an investigation about very serious allegations, both for the sake of the accused and the accuser. How do you balance that confidentiality with the kind of transparency that's required for the faithful to sort of not to to, to see that, say, a law like Bosestis is actually working? Well, uh, they don't have to know the gory details uh, of what is going on, but they should be uh, made aware that an investigation is underway, uh, that it has been uh, completed and a report sent to the Holy See, and this is the outcome. Uh, if you're a victim, uh, you need to know that your complaint was taken seriously and people did something about it. And if the result is not to discipline the one whom you accused of wrongdoing, then you ought to get an explanation. Uh, if you are the one who was accused, uh, you ought to know what you're accused of and what is the evidence that is being used against you and when is this process ever over? And if uh, you are exonerated, this occasionally happens or sometimes happens, uh, you have a right to have an attempt made at least to restore your reputation. Uh, at least with pre ordinary priests, once there is a credible accusation of misconduct, you are removed from your position. Uh, your parishioners are told that you are under investigation. Uh, so your rep reputation is already pretty badly tarnished. So if you are exonerated at the end of the process, um, then uh, you ought, people ought to be told that we did all of these things and we could not substantiate the claim. Bishops deserve the same. And the community ne needs to know that uh, a process was undertaken, that it was serious. Uh, you don't have to give all the details, but you can give an idea of what all was done to look into the matter uh, and that this is the result. Uh, we did take this seriously. We did act on it, and here is what we are doing. Steve, if I could uh, jump in here and just add that Please. one of the steps that the USCCB took that's not specifically outlined uh, in Vos Estes is uh, the uh, establishment of a third-party uh, reporting system, a hotline, basically. So uh, that, I think, has been very helpful uh, because uh, there are two people uh, you know, if they have a general idea that somehow this is going to go to the Metropolitan or to the Nuncio, they don't know what a Metropolitan is or who and what a Nuncio is and where do I find their phone number. Uh, but when we have a um, we have a link where you, uh, I, I know our diocese does this, most dioceses have something similar where we have on our diocesan website a page for safe environment and then a link that says how to make a report uh, and it, 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 for di different categories for priests, uh, for, bishop, for the bishop himself, and then it would take you to that third party reporting system, either with uh, an email address or, uh, or the hotline phone number. So I think that's been very helpful in terms of how to get into the system. I, I, and I, so I agree that you know, making that 
transparent is important. I think what um, is not so clear to me is what's the follow-up on that. So once the initial report is, is made, I think the third party reporting system kind of sees their task as, as done. They get, they get the information and they pass it on to the appropriate parties, but they uh, rightfully don't see themselves as they're the continuing contact with the person making the call, rightfully so. I don't think they're contracted to do that. Uh, so the question is uh, who, who keeps in touch uh, with the uh, with with the person making the allegation. Now, even if you have a, an assistance ministry, uh, the assistance ministry is maybe more in, in terms of uh, psychological help or counseling, but may not even be aware of for the progress of the case. So, who is it in, in, that is involved in the case? Is it somebody from the office of the Metropolitan Archbishop? Is it someone from the Nuncio's office, or uh, who eventually uh, keeps in touch with both? The alleged bishop and the uh, the person bringing the allegation to let them know how their case is proceeding and what the eventual outcome of the uh, investigation has been. Stephen, uh, could I just say something too about yeah. uh, the question you asked? Um, I think is a very good one, and uh, Father Beal outlined I think where this will go. the The answers to the questions have to be distinguished between the different phases the investigative phase, the penal process, and then the end, then for the people who were involved. So there's a lot of distinctions. What we're going to do uh, to build on the conference that you mentioned in December 2019 is to do a comparative study of different civil jurisdictions around the world of how they handle the confidentiality, the proper confidentiality in these different stages, but then also the transparency of the information. When can you say what about who and to whom? Uh, and to learn from them. Uh, just briefly, you know, I think publishing jurisprudence, for example, once a decision is made, publishing it, but that's not easy. You know, you can't put the victim's names in it. There's certain details that would help us to know who they are. You, you, know, you have to learn how to do this. So I, I think this also connects with your question about working with experts in different fields where you have a lot to learn. And then we have our own culture, of course, and how it is that we can, you know, so the victims really can know at each stage what's, what's going on, what's happening, how to make a response. That was a, a preemption of exactly the question I wanted to ask you. So thank you for that. I, um, uh, I've mentioned this well, at least once already, but I think it's worth repeating that, that this is a, Vosestis is law for, for the whole church and the, the situation um, in other countries is not necessarily the way we Americans assume it is. And, and the things that make us impatient, we might actually have it pretty good to, compared to other places. So uh, getting a, a more global perspective is always helpful. Um, we, we don't have much time left. Um, so I want to go to, to to one last question for, for each of you. Um, and then if there's any time at all left, maybe one or two questions that have come in over the chat. Um, very simply, uh, if Pope Francis were to call you tomorrow and say, I'm writing Vos Estes 2.0, uh, what's one recommendation you would have for how it might be improved? What would you say? Susan, we'll start with you. Oh, thanks, Stephen. Wow. I have a lot of recommendations. Just even like- You only the... get one. You only get okay, one. Only get one. Only get one. Okay. Um, you see in article one, Vos Estes introduces the term vulnerable persons. This is new to canon law, that, that term and that definition, but it just stops there. It says these vulnerable persons, and it says that you have to report sexual acts that were committed by these people with vulnerable persons. In recent years, we know that um, the big topic, the big question has been the abuse of adults in power imbalance situations. We know that any adult can be vulnerable in the right circumstance, but you know, especially like a seminarian with a, a priest or a bishop or a member of a religious order with a religious superior. And um, so we need to recognize that, um, yes, there are adults who are, are habitually vulnerable due to their state of mind or, you know, some, some infirmity that they might have, but we have to recognize that institutional vulnerability and the, the harm that it causes to persons in those situations. Right now, um, you know, in canon law, it's it's really hard to figure out what to do with those. Uh, we we don't treat those cases in the same way we do as abuse of minors. 
Um, there's a question whether or not you can even call that abuse. Uh, I can't well, let's see that this is a situation between two adults. And then you have to go through this process to figure out was there force or threats? Was it, you know, um, an abuse of office that you can argue? There's just a lot of lack of clarity in the law. So what we need is um, to articulate more specifically that this is a crime and this is the expected response from ecclesiastical authority when that occurs. That's where we kind of have this gray area right now that we need more definition on. Thank you. Father Beal. Uh, the church has not historically been good at evaluating programs and processes. So my recommendation would be assemble all the people over the last three years who have been working on these cases and pick their brains about what works and what doesn't and what needs to be fixed. Uh, rather than try to do it uh, in an academic way, uh, ask the people who have tried it and run into stone walls and somehow found their way around them. So that was what I would do. Monsignor Oliver? Uh, there's two things about post Estes. One, I don't think we need to work on. It's the procedures. The, the procedures will last. We need to get them better. And they're different around the world, honestly. So, you know, I think in those terms, we're committed. We're going to process. And this is just the beginning. This is just the invest. This is just the reporting. Now the investigation, the process, and all the rest. The second part that we haven't talked about very much, and that's the definition of delicts. You have to define something as a crime in order to be able to process it in a judicial or now an extrajudicial penal process. Postestes doesn't yet do that. In particular, it doesn't define a penalty, which means you can't go to a penalty process. <laughs> And it doesn't define things like prescription and, and others. There's one major document very close and on the way that we haven't mentioned. So I would say, what is the thing we need to do is to connect Rosestes to the new book six of the Code of Canon Law, the Western Code of Canon Law, because that defines crimes and it defines penalties. And these two need to come together, particularly when we're talking about things like vulnerable persons, uh, the new definitions of pornography in Vos Estes. So when we're defining crimes, Vos Estes is using new language, the abuse of authority and all that. That needs to be connected now to the new book six so that we can move forward with these penal processes. Bishop Paprocki. Hey, thank you. Yes, I think I would like to see um, more specificity uh, an articulation of Article 13, the involvement of qualified persons. I think for the integrity of the process and for the credibility that people to, can really trust the process, uh, that should be clear. Uh, because what you're, you know, the, the Metropolitan, the way it's written now, uh, can uh, call on the assistance of uh, qualified lay persons, uh, the bishops of the region, of the province, individually or together, can establish a list of qualified persons from which the Metropolitan may choose the most suitable to assist the investigation uh, according to the needs of the individual case. So what's, what's not clear there is, um, you know, who is he actually calling upon? And, uh, you know, I, I think the person bringing the allegation and, and to the general public are perhaps thinking, well, well, the Metropolitan has an ongoing relationship with all of his suffragan bishops. There's almost a built-in conflict of interest there. It's like, how can I be impartial with my suffragan bishops that I work, I'm working with all the time? Or if you're, if it's against the Metropolitan, you're the senior suffragan, how can you be impartial with, with your own Metropolitan? And, and so I think uh, to, for the Metropolitan or the senior suffragan to be able to say, I consulted with these people, uh, this is my, review board or whatever you want to call it, my commission that I established to advise me in these cases. And, and uh, they made the recommendation, which then I forwarded uh, to the Holy See. Well, you know, yes, I did. I agree with it or disagree with it. But I think it uh, just as we found in the handling of priest cases, uh, you know, the bishops are working directly with their priests. They have an ongoing relationship. Bishops and metropolitans don't have a relationship uh, that for the most part with, with uh, the the victims. And uh, so there's this sense, well, the, the bishop's going to listen to the priest, not to me, uh, or the, the metropolitan is going to listen to the bishop and not to me. 
And so I think for the credibility of that process, more, greater clarity on, on who is the bishop uh, consulting with would be helpful. Is that something that needs to be addressed? Uh, just to follow up on that, that, that point, is that something that would need to be addressed um, by Rome or is that something that particular law in the United States could, could handle? Well, there probably has to be somewhat, uh, uh, you know, particular law because, uh, you know, from country to country, uh, it's going to be, you know, somewhat different. But I, I think I would, I would put a little more teeth into it than what is currently in Vos Estes that uh, kind of makes it uh, almost discretionary. Uh, you know, it's a good idea if you want to use some qualified lay people. But in the end, I suppose if the Metropolitan doesn't do that, I don't know that there's any consequences for not involving the qualified lay person. So uh, I think I'd give it a little more specificity and um, some, a little more teeth to it. Uh, but at the same time, to leave, uh, yes, to leave the particulars to the, uh, the local uh, regions and local provinces. Thank you. Well, we are just about out of time. Um, I would like to, to thank each of you for coming. Thank you to all of uh, our, our viewers, our audience watching online. Um, I hope all of you will uh, check out these videos once they're posted on YouTube, share them around, and check out the rest of the work that we're doing at the Catholic Project here at Catholic University to, to marshal the university's resources to try and address this crisis in the church and beyond. Thank you so much. I hope all of you have a, a, a very good afternoon. Uh, you can learn more about us uh, at catholicproject.catholic.edu. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, I think that's sufficient. Mm -hmm. Thanks, everyone. Appreciate it. Uh, we'll let you